Okay, in this video, we're going to look at a more or less a preview to uh, the second alcohol chapter. What we're going to do in this first video is re reveal the key things that we know from the alcohol chapter one back in the first half of the class. And we're uh, going to look at some new reactions uh, that alcohols do. Okay. All right, so let's look, review some of the key findings. Okay, from that previous chapter, this reaction right here, where we're taking an alcohol and an alkyl halide, and from that making, sorry, an, an alcohol and an acid, and from that we're making a alkyl halide in water. Okay, the proton on an alcohol, alcohol proton, very similar in water and, uh, to uh, the hydrogens of water, and its pK is very similar to that. It's about 16 to 19. The acidity, again, is comparable to water. In this chapter, we're going to see many additional reactions, plus we're going to look at the element directly underneath oxygen, sulfur, and look at a few reactions there. And we're going to find that this uh, chapter here has substantial integration with the previous chapter and with the chapter that comes after it. Okay, so let's review alcohol reactions that we had in the first half of the class. All right, so we can add water to alkenes, okay, the elements of water. All right, so one reagent that'll do that is sulfuric acid water or uh, more reliably mercuric acetate and sodium borohydride. This results in the Markovnikov addition product right here. All right, um, when we uh, use this uh, boron reagent right here and add it to the alkene, we get hydrogen there, water there, but we get the anti-Markovnikov orientation. So we have uh, two ways to add water to an alkene. All right, we can add one OH group and one halogen by treating alkenes with uh, water uh, with uh, halogens in the presence of water and this gives us the uh, halohydrin right here uh, this is uh, also called markovnikov orientation because of where the oxygen ends up it ends up like where it is there all right uh, we can turn an alcohol into a leaving group by treating it with paratoluene sulfonyl chloride and pyridine or alternatively we can turn it into a halogen with either of these reagents here or the reagent that we saw uh, in the previous slide. However, these reagents are excellent for primary alcohols. Okay, uh, reaction we didn't cover in that chapter, but it's worthwhile noting is that uh, the alcohols uh, have a pKa similar to water, but if we want to deprotonate them completely, we have to use a base stronger than sodium hydroxide, all right? Uh, Okay, so some bases that will do this pretty good are just sodium metal. This is uh, actually going to produce hydrogen as a byproduct. Sodium hydride also produces hydrogen as a byproduct, and uh, Na, NH2 will produce ammonia as a byproduct. Alternatively, as we saw in the previous chapter, if we treat alcohols with Greenyard reagents or organolithium reagents, we simply remove the proton, and that will also give the alkoxide. All right, the key reaction of alcohols that we saw in the previous chap uh, half of the class was their dehydration. Okay, so this, uh, if we treat an alcohol with strong acid and heat, uh, usually sulfuric acid, we're going to get the alkene. Um, this is subject to something called Saitsev's rule, where we get the more substituted alkene out of all the possibilities. All right, let's review. Um, a very important reaction from the previous chapter. One of the best ways to make alcohols is this carbon-carbon bond forming reaction shown in the previous chapter, where we're going to take an organolithium reagent or a Greenyard reagent, followed by acid, and this is going to give us a tertiary alcohol. So a ketone will give a tertiary alcohol, an aldehyde uh, in the same type of reaction will give a secondary alcohol, and formaldehyde, shown here, will give a primary alcohol. So um, this is a very powerful method to uh, construct 
alcohols. And uh, when we get to multi-step synthesis problems, this is going to be one of the instrumental reactions that you're going to want to use because it's a reaction that increases the complexity of the uh, product substantially because it makes a carbon-carbon bond. All right, let's look at some new reactions that lead to alcohols, okay? As we saw uh, in the previous slide, we were adding anionic carbon. What about anionic hydrogen, okay? Um, so we can turn an aldehyde or a ketone into the corresponding alcohol through a net reduction process, okay? One way you can do this, if you look at the difference here between the alcohol and the ketone, is that it's just added these two hydrogen atoms right here, right? So those two hydrogen atoms have been added and they come from hydrogen, okay? This is exactly analogous to a double bond uh, being hydrogenated with hydrogen and a metal. All right. Okay, so this is one way to do it. However, uh, it turns out that uh, this reagent this reagent system here is more suited for alkene hydrogenation than uh, carbonyl group hydrogenation. It takes a little bit of pressure and sometimes special catalysts to, uh, to do this reaction. Plus, if you have an alkene in your molecule, uh, you, you find that the alkene is usually more reactive to this reagent than the carbonyl group is. If you could very carefully measure the amount of hydrogen you put in and be very careful to add one mole during the hydrogenation of this compound, you would find that you probably get more of this compound from reduction of the alkene than you get from reduction of the C double bond O group. Okay, the preferred reagents actually are what we call sources of nucleophilic hydride. Uh, these are sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Recognize that these are really analogous reagents. Uh, sodium and lithium are in the first column of the periodic table. Boron and aluminum are in both in the third column of the periodic table. Okay, sodium borohydride tends to be less reactive and more selective. Um, lithium aluminum hydride tends to be more reactive and less selective. All right, this reagent here, sodium borohydride, is the one that people will you gravitate to first because it's safer. Okay, sodium borohydride reacts only slowly with water, whereas lithium aluminum hydride reacts violently with water. So for safety purposes, people will use sodium borohydride if they can get away with it, if it's reactive enough. All right, so here's the reaction equation. We're going to take sodium borohydride, then work it up with methanol or water, or lithium aluminum hydride, and work it up with water. And what we're going to find is we get the alcohol. The hydrogenic carbon comes from the hydride reagent. The hydrogen and oxygen comes from whatever we use to uh, add later. Okay, all right, so let's look at uh, the mechanism for this reaction right here. What we're going to find here is that we can think of the hydride in this case as being basically a source of H minus. Okay. All right, so this is nucleophilic hydride. Like before, we saw nucleophiles add directly to the carbonyl carbon, and they're doing it here just as well. Okay, so this is exactly like the Greener uh, addition that you saw previously, except we're adding H minus instead of carbon minus. All right, so uh, I've taken a little bit of creative license here. This analogy where we turn borohydride into H minus is going to work for most of this class. We're going to find one case where it doesn't much later, okay? All right, so um, it's not really the alkoxide, it's the, uh, the uh, boron borate derivative here. All right, so at this point, uh, you still have several boron hydrogen bonds and you can do this reaction three more times and eventually end up with this uh, borate reagent here. And this is really not what people want as the final product. You just treat it with water or methanol and this turns the uh, borate into four molecules of an alcohol and your boron goes away as uh, boric acid or the uh, 
uh, conjugate base of boric acid, depending on the uh, pH of your workup solution. Okay. All right. So because this is reacting like H minus, it, it's very selective for reacting with what we call an electrophile, this electrophilic center right here. So remember that uh, here we have a lot of partial positive charge character due to the dipole. And uh, because of this reactivity issue, we're going to only see hydrides or these reagents react with electrophilic compounds. All right. So let's predict the products of uh, these reactions here. And um, I've shown this react, react this uh, mechanistic slide here with boron, but it can work with lithium just as well. Remember, lithium is underneath boron in the periodic table. All right, so let's predict what we're going to get from each of these reagents. Okay, sodium borohydride and uh, methanol reacting with this ketone here is going to produce that alcohol. All right, this one has an alkene present, and we're going to react this with lithium aluminum hydride. We're going to get exclusive reaction at the carbonyl group, not at the alkene, and this is going to produce that compound. All right, uh, sodium borohydride methanol here is going to add exclusively to the carbonyl compound, and there's some hydride reagents that will displace halogens, but sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride generally do not do that very effectively. And our product here is the compound that you see here. All right, so let's uh, look at uh, other carbonyl containing compounds. Uh, we're just going to look at carboxylic acids here. What we're going to find is that a carboxylic acid reduces uh, twice or adds two hydride units in to produce the primary alcohol. Like in the previous case, we're initially making this compound here and this functional group here is known as a hydrate. This is where we have two OH groups on the same carbon. Okay. This is not a stable type of compound. We'll discuss that more in Chapter 17. This type of compound, known as a hydrate, typically eliminates water to give us the carbonyl compound, uh, the aldehyde in this case. And what you notice here is that an aldehyde also reacts with this reagent. So this is going to react with uh, the lithium aluminum hydride and produce that. All right, because the aldehyde is more reactive than the carboxylic acid, we'll discuss the relative reactivity of carbonyl compounds later in the class, but uh, there's no way to stop this reaction right here. Once you make this, it's going to uh, be more reactive to the re uh, reagent lithium aluminum hydride than was the starting material. Okay, all right. This reaction, uh, because the carboxylic acid is not reactive as a ketone or an aldehyde, it requires lithium aluminum hydride. Okay. We cannot use sodium borohydride here. Sodium borohydride is not reactive enough. Okay, so let's look at a few reaction equations and see if we can predict uh, the, react the products of these reactions. All right, so here we have a carboxylic acid and an alkene. We're treating it with lithium aluminum hydride. We should reduce only the carboxylic acid to the corresponding primary alcohol, and that's the product that we have here. Okay, all right. Here we're going to treat this next compound with a large excess of alum lithium aluminum hydride. Both of these functional groups are reactive to lithium aluminum hydride, and we should expect to get the complete reduction product shown here. Here uh, in this one, we're going to do a very hard experiment. Let's add exactly the right amount of lithium aluminum hydride, uh, which would be a fourth of a mole because all four hydrogens add. Uh, and then we're going to quench it with water. What we're going to find here is that the reaction is going to initially occur at the ketone over the carboxylic acid, and we would probably make that compound. This is really a very hard experiment uh, to carry 
out. Okay, and we'll find that if someone wanted to do this, they would use the reaction immediately below it, where we use the reagent that's only reactive to C double bond O's, sodium borohydride, and no matter how much sodium borohydride we add here, it's probably not going to touch the carboxylic acid, and we would expect to get the same compound that we see above. Okay, all right, yeah, those are the same compounds. Okay, all right, um, we're going to talk more about this reaction in the next chapter, but we're going to introduce it here. Okay, all right, now epoxide has a partial positive there. It's actually got a lot of angle strain. So um, when you treat an epoxide with uh, a Grignard reagent, you're actually going to get a nucleophilic addition, okay? And we're going to find that we add two carbons to the original Grignard reagent, okay? Those two carbons there have now been incorporated. And we end up, after the uh, later treatment with water, we end up with a primary alcohol. Okay, so we've added two carbons and we get a primary alcohol. The carbon-carbon bond that we form here is not the carbon-carbon bond adjacent to the OH group like it was with greener reagents adding to C double bond O's, but it's actually at the beta carbon. Okay, we'll call that one alpha, we'll call that one beta. So we're making the bond to the beta carbon when we do this reaction. All right, so let's see if uh, we're going to revisit this reaction in chapter 16. Uh, here we're only going to use the symmetrical epoxide, ethylene oxide, for the most part in this chapter. Okay, all right, so let's predict the products of these reactions. All right, so this compound here has three carbons. We're going to add two. We should end up with a compound that has five carbons, and this is the product that we predict that we're going to get from that reaction. All right, in this next one, we're going to predict our starting material. All right, so we're going to make the bond right there, and the product that we need should be the uh, Greenyard reaction that corresponds, Greenyard reagent that corresponds to that unit, and this is the product that we would uh, use or this is the starting material that we would use to make that product. Okay, and one final reaction, and this is unique to 1,2-diols, uh, okay? So here we have a type of product known as a 1,2-diol, uh, a synonym for a 1,2-diol It's also a glycol, okay? All right, so when we treat alkenes with osmium tetraoxide, a very expensive compound, okay, also a very toxic compound, we're gonna get this type of structure here, known as an osmate ester. Nobody wants that, really. Uh, there's not a lot of worldwide demand for compounds that have osmium in them, okay? But once you treat this with sodium hydroxide and T-butanol, you're going to end up now with the 1,2-diol. And another interesting fact about this 1,2-diol is that these are cis, and the alkene that you started with was cis, okay? Cis cyclohexene. So this is characterized as a syn addition, okay? So we do uh, add an OH group to both carbons to the same face of the molecule, all right? The hydrolysis product is OSO3, and we can turn it back into OSO4 by treating it with a peroxide reagent like this. All right, so you don't have to use a whole mole of osmium tetraoxide. All you have to use is a tiny amount of sodium of osmium tetraoxide, and we're going to use T-butyl hydroperoxide as the uh, ultimate oxidant here. 
Okay, so under these conditions, osmium tetraoxide, just one mole percent, then a mole of t-butyl hydroperoxide, usually done with uh, t-butanol and KOH as the base. This gives us the sin diol very selectively. Okay, this is a sin addition. So if we start with a uh, trans product versus a cis product, Okay, we're going to get products that are diastereomers of each other, like we've seen back uh, in the previous uh, half of the class. Okay, so the trans starting material is going to give the syndiol shown here, which is a chiral compound. We'll call this the DL isomer. And when we use the cis Diol. Okay, uh, we're going to get the compound that's shown here, uh, which is the uh, miso compound. I've drawn these in the uh, extended all anti conformations, but uh, important point to realize here is that when we look at what we initially get from this reaction, it's uh, It's this compound. Okay. And let's see, we have three of them. All right, so we're going to rotate here uh, and turn it into the uh, other confirmation. There you can see that uh, when you had it in this confirmation, you can sort of see you have a plane of symmetry right there, and that defines the meso compound. All right, so you get diastereomeric products when you have E and Z alkenes as starting materials. Okay, this is where we're going to stop the first video. Uh, we're going to look at uh, react, new reactions of alcohols in the next video. Okay, all right, so let's uh, stop.